Psalm 122, a psalm of David. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we are poor and needy and in need of being fed. Help me to rightly divide the word of truth and grant us ears to hear. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Of the many things that we take for granted, and I would imagine that we could assemble a fairly long list, couldn't we? But of the many things that we take for granted in the Christian life, worship is certainly one of the greatest. Which is quite curious given the privilege that we have in worship. In his song of deliverance, a different psalm than this one, in his song of deliverance, David describes the Lord as worthy to be praised. Further confirmed by John's revelation of the throne room of heaven, where those who cast their crowns before the Lord cry out, Worthy are you, our Lord and God. God is worthy. Worthy of our praise. If God is worthy of earthly and heavenly, universal and eternal praise, then worship is not only a necessity for all of creation, but it is also a privilege of the people of God. We are privileged to worship the Lord. Rightly does David confess, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. But David's joy in this is not reclusive, but inclusive. Not private, but public. Individual private worship has its place. It's not here. David describes And desires his intent to worship him who is worthy with those who are not. For this he has been waiting with his brothers and with his companions. Their feet, as he puts it poetically, have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. And in that statement, David is certainly personifying Jerusalem, the locale of the Lord's house. And he announces their readiness. We sense in this an anticipation. David wants to do this. He anticipates going to the house of the Lord. Let's go. Let's do this. Let's go to the house of God. As David went with his brethren to worship, so we have the same privilege Every Lord's Day. We worship not in a temple, but as a temple. Not on the seventh day, signifying the completion of creation, but on the first day, worshiping as new creations through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We worship the one true God through the spirit of the risen Christ. Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Not as a promise to claim, but a statement of fact. Not awaiting a head count, 
or an invitation, but by His indwelling spiritual presence in our worship as a sacred assembly. Which incidentally is what the word church means. But unlike David and his brethren, we have a privilege that he only longed for. Though the king of the nation, he was restricted on the outside of the curtain of the Holy of Holies. Representing the dwelling place of the Lord But brothers and sisters in Christ, on this side of the cross, the writer of Hebrews explains, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let that sink in. In Christ, you enjoy a privilege that a man after God's own heart longed for. How then can we not exclaim to, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Surely this must be the right heart attitude. Surely this must be the exclamation of every child of God. Don't you think? And yet, does David's exclamation sound a little foreign? Maybe maybe just a little too zealous. I mean, after all, this was the man who danced before the Ark of the Covenant in a linen ephod. Right? I mean, we can count on David for passion and exclamation points. In our time, however, giving a solemn caution, in our time, R.C. Sproul observes, we have experienced a radical eclipse of God. It hides the real character of God from His people. It has brought a profound loss of the sense of holiness. And with that, any sense of the gravity and seriousness of godly worship. Consequently, we fail to make a transition Sunday morning from the secular to the sacred, from the common to the uncommon, from the profane to the holy. And I think R.C.'s right. And one of the reasons for this eclipse, as he puts it, I believe, is that we have forsaken the assembling of ourselves together in Lord's Day worship. Lord's Day worship has become one among many options in the multiple choice of Sunday morning options. David's fervor sounds foreign to ears that are deaf to God's call to worship. May God have mercy upon the American church sounding a Sunday morning wake-up call to assemble for worship. But as true as I believe this is, shame will not open deaf ears. Only the gospel will do. Only the gospel will do. And in it we see the privilege that we have Leading us, and think about it this way, leading us in gratitude together in worship. Yes, we gather in gratitude. When we assemble in worship, we are getting to do and doing the very thing that we were created to do. The chief end that we were given, we get that opportunity to do. The psalmist cries out in Psalm 150, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so how can we not assemble on the Lord's day and say it with a grateful heart, Oh God, you made me for this. It's not only why I'm I'm here. I exist for this purpose. And let us cultivate a grateful heart 
that we can pray like this. O oh Lord, we rejoice in another Lord's day when we call up our minds from the cares of the world and attend upon Thee without distraction. We are going to the house of prayer. Pour upon us the spirit of grace and supplication. We are going to the house of praise. Awaken in us every grateful and cheerful emotion. We are going to the house of instruction. Give testimony to the word preached and glorify it in the hearts of all who hear. May that be our Lord's Day prayer. Because beloved, we enjoy a high privilege. Let us worship God. Let us worship God. Now, in considering the privilege we have to worship... We can't dismiss the emphasis that David puts on place. If you look at the passage with me, if you look at the psalm, it is as if on his way to the house of David, David is looking around and he is commentating on what he observes in the city of Jerusalem. You see, for David, place and praise are unequivocally yoked. By God's design, Jerusalem is the capital city of a nation consisting of His chosen people. But it is more than the city. It is the designated place of assembly. It is the locale for the house of the Lord. Fittingly, David describes Jerusalem. Look at verse 3 with me. He describes Jerusalem as a city that is bound firmly together. That's a poetic expression, meaning that it is a city that is designed to accommodate an assembly. And so the children of Israel, they come to Jerusalem, tribe by tribe, as decreed by God. Three times a year, three times a year at the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, commemorating the Exodus, at the Feast of Weeks, commemorating the conquest of the Promised Land, at the Feast of Booths, commemorating the Lord's continued care, men representing their families and representing their tribes would come and bring sacrifices of worship to the Lord, giving thanks, as David puts it in this psalm, to the name of the Lord. Giving thanks to the name of the Lord. Why? For the Lord's name signifies His blessing and His protection, as well as the solemn guarantee by covenant that He will fulfill all His promises. David then adds that Jerusalem is the location, and I find this incredibly fascinating, it's the location of the, quote, thrones of judgment. Specifically, the thrones of the house of David. Don't you find that curious within this psalm of worship? To American ears, this sounds odd, or at least sounds odd to these American ears. Linking the judicial with the spiritual, is that appropriate? But we must remember that in the covenant kingdom of Israel, there was no separation of church and state. The civil and the political... And the religious offices were centered in one city in that nation, and that's Jerusalem. As one commentator explains, people looked to Jerusalem for justice. It was to be the place where truth came to the forefront of all disputes, and the king meted out just and equitable rulings. Or you may recall that Solomon, King David's son, prayed this, Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. But in considering this, we must be careful in our consideration of David's Jerusalem. Every earthly place has its limits. When Jesus traveled to Jerusalem... Do you recall that when he arrived, he didn't rejoice. What did he do? He wept. He wept, for he foreknew the imminent destruction 
of that city. And he lamented with these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. For Israel, its capital city, and its house of worship, you see, were pointing to something greater. Something greater and global. Transcending Jerusalem city limits. As Jesus revealed to the woman at the well, and as was read earlier, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Jesus goes on to say, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. As the Father sought, so we were found. By the sovereign grace of God. Calling us not to make a trek to Jerusalem. But to assemble everywhere and every place across the world. For the new covenant place of worship is where we, the people of God, assemble. As the temple of the living God, as the Apostle Paul described us. Not built upon the rocky mound of Jerusalem's temple mound. But we are the temple of God built where? Upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Rightly did the Puritans not refer to their church buildings as churches. They referred to them as meeting houses, which I think is just brilliant. Why did they do that? Because you see, the church consists of those who profess faith in Christ and their children, bound firmly together, assembling locally, yet comprised of people from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Looking back to David's Jerusalem, as he describes it in Psalm 122, Matthew Henry, that great Puritan commentator, says, Jerusalem was a type of the gospel church, which is compact together in holy love and Christian communion, so that it is All as one city. And this certainly echoes what the Apostle John saw in his revelation. And what we will witness in the new heaven and the new earth. In terms descriptive of the church, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, in realization of who we are in Christ, in anticipation of what awaits us, every Lord's Day, every Lord's Day, we ascend. We ascend corporately as the church militant unites with the church triumphant, offering up our sacrifice of praise to God. And in our worship, It is but a foretaste of heaven to come. Behold, this is the place of worship. Let us worship God. It is not coincidental that David follows his description of justice in Jerusalem with a command. And what's the command that he gives us? It's in the third part of the psalm. Look at it with me. The command is what? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Hebrew word translated peace, as you probably know, is the Hebrew word shalom. Now, just to chase a rabbit for just a second, fascinatingly enough, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. The Hebrew word for security or 
secure is shalva. And in Hebrew, there is an alliteration. There is a rhyming, so to speak, there of shalom and shalva. It doesn't carry forward quite so well with peace and security. But the general idea is more important than the alliteration, right? We are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That shalom, which is more than just the absence of conflict. It is a holistic well-being. Every part of our being, every part, in this case, of the city for which David prays. In the case of Jerusalem, it's a civil, it's a political, it's a religious peace. Enjoyed according to God's favor. Pointing toward the perfect peace. By God's justice in the cross of Christ. And the peace that we enjoy with God in the Accomplished justice in Christ's sacrifice, burial, and resurrection. And in this psalm, and this is in the English language, not in the original Hebrew, but you'll note in the third part of this psalm, we see that the, the translators now have added quotation marks. Pray for the peace of Israel, or for, for Jerusalem, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, then quotation marks. Well, what they're doing there is they're drawing our attention to what David is telling us to pray for. Pray for this, we might say. Pray for the security of those who love it. Pray that it will be a peaceful and secure place. Employing metaphor, David points to the walls He points to the citadels. Look at these emblems of security. Look at them. Pray for Jerusalem. In fact, if you're looking at the text with me, you'll see that the preposition that begins with within is repeated, that phrase is repeated three times. It is a repetition for peace. Within your walls. Within your towers. Within you. It is within, not without, that peace and security are enjoyed. And in a sense, we hear an echo of David's zeal when Jesus drove those money changers out of the temple. It is written, Jesus said, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. John says that his disciples, Jesus' disciples, remembered zeal for your house will consume me. And so it did. For the temple in Jerusalem pointed to something greater than its temporal location. As the place of worship became one of spirit and truth, so all true worshipers are called to the house of prayer, to the place of peace. And praise. When you and I, when we assemble in worship, we do do so presenting our petitions, singing our prayers to the Lord our God. There is a time for private worship. But when we assemble, you and I, we pray collectively. We pray corporately. I becomes we. Me becomes us. King David's command foreshadows King Jesus' command. When he commanded us, pray then like this. In which we are taught to praise and petition our Father in heaven. Together is Christ's church. For in it we enjoy the peace and security of the presence of the Lord. And so we sing, as we sang earlier, now with joyful exultation, let us sing to God our praise, to the rock of our salvation, loud hosannas, let us raise, thankful tribute, gladly bringing, let us come before Him now, and with psalms His praises singing, joyful in His presence bow. Every Lord's Day, every Lord's Day, we gather in worship to bow before Him 
in his presence. We assemble not in, but as a house of prayer, praising him who is worthy of our praise. This is our privilege in this place. Let us bow our heads in prayer, for we are in his beloved, we are in his presence, beloved. Let us worship God. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, help us not to take for granted the privilege that we enjoy to worship you every Lord's Day. Let us not take for granted the privilege that we have together corporately as your people. Let us be glad to say to one another, let us go to that house of meeting that we may praise the Lord together. And as we assemble as your people, the temple of the living God, may we cry out in praise together, worshiping you. May we assemble to worship you in spirit, in truth, as our prayers ascend to heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so it is in his name that we pray. Amen.